up on your feet. This is no time to tire. The man who lies asleep will never wake in fame, and his desire and all his life drift past him like a dream, and the traces of his memory fade from time like smoke and air or ripples on a stream. Now, therefore, rise, control your breath, and call upon the strength of soul that wins all battles, unless it sink and the gross bodies fall. There is a longer ladder yet to climb. This much is not enough. Hello, everyone. Ben DiBono here for the Sci-Fi Christian, and I forego, uh, decided to forego our normal intro music this week because we reached the section of the Divine Comedy that contains what is probably my favorite quote of uh, anything in this magnificent work. And of course, you know, work like this, there's many great candidates for something like that. But uh, the speech that Virgil gives there uh, to Dante is absolutely masterful, occurring in Canto 24 as they climb their way out of Malibolge 6 in uh, Circle 8. Um, we'll get to this quote and more in just a minute, but I wanted to, to start with it because I think it really sets the tone for what's going on in this section of the Inferno and also what is to come in uh, what we'll be reading starting next week with uh, Purgatorio. And we start on that, which by the way, uh, if you're reading along with us at the Sci-Fi Christian, be through Canto 9 of Purgatorio by next week's video. So a little bit less to do. But I, I don't know, this is one, maybe it just resonates with me. Um, but I love what Virgil says here. You know, this much is not enough. Uh, those words alone are, are absolutely chilling. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's words that both, it's meant to invoke purgatory and the upcoming climb there. But I think it also touches into something we were talking about last week, maybe to just pick up right where we left off of last week's Lenten Reflection, where I was talking about how our sins just feel tiring, and, and we start out something like Lent doing well, uh, and then we sort of fall off a little bit, and, and we get used to our sins, and we do, they don't repulse us anymore. And... I think that what Virgil says here to Dante, or Dante says to himself through Virgil, if you want to take a metafictional view of it, is really something that needs to be said to all of us. This much is not enough. There is a longer ladder yet to climb. Chilling words. Um, so I do want to get into the summary like we normally do, but I wanted to start with that because it's too good of a quote to risk it being caught in the shuffle of our discussion for this week. So, um, perhaps we will have more to say about that as the video goes on, uh, but I couldn't resist starting with that to share with you what I believe is perhaps the most profound quote uh, in the Divine Comedy. All right, I'm gonna move through the summary portion of the video very quickly this week, because there's a lot to talk about and these videos are already going on uh, much too long uh, or at least much longer than I intended. I suppose you guys can be the judge of if it's too long or not. Uh, though I do appreciate those of you who are watching and sticking with it and listening to me ramble on. All right, so we left off in Malibolge. Those are the evil pouches or evil pockets or evil ditches. To put different translations render it differently, of course, of uh, Circle 8. And uh, we pick up in Malibolge 6. There are 10 of them, you'll remember. Uh, with the hypocrites, and the hypocrites walk around. That's Sam the dog here, by the way, sneaking into the view. The hypocrites will uh, walk around with kind of um, friar shawls. I don't know, or habits, I guess you would call them. I'm a Catholic. I should know the terminology here. Uh, but instead of being made of cloth, like a normal habit would be, they are made of metals. So they are excruciatingly heavy. And all the hypocrites in there have the, these things as they wander around their circle, except for one guy, Caiaphas, who is crucified on the ground and has everyone walk over him, Caiaphas being the high priest who played a particularly important role in the crucifixion of Jesus. Next up, we have the Thebes, uh, who are, just as they stole things from others, they have their very identity stolen from them as they're bitten by these snakes, and they, you know, sometimes 
kind of do the phoenix thing where they uh, collapse into a pile of ashes and then you get this kind of weird snake melding thing with all these sinners at the end of that canto which i gotta tell you i i'm reading multiple translations simultaneously as we do this so I, i've read that section now about four or five times this week and i still don't quite know how to visualize it it's just such a crazy image that he has there at the end of what, what canto would that be 25 where they kind of morph into each other next up in the next two cantos we go to malabolge 8 where we have the false counselors uh, Chief among them, Ulysses, also known as Odysseus, Ulysses being the Latin name for Odysseus. And you might be wondering, well, what's, what's Dante got against Odysseus? Well, you have to remember that Dante is uh, very partisan for Rome. And in classical mythology and, and, and the classics, we have Virgil, Homer, all that good stuff, Rome is very closely identified with the Trojans. Uh, I'm just watching the dog here. He's going for his bed, so he might knock over the camera. So if that happens, fair warning. Um, so the, because of that, Odysseus is on the side. He's the one who, according to classical understanding, comes up with the idea to have the Trojan horse contributes to the fall of Troy. So he's a bad dude in Dante's estimation. We might not see him that way so much now, but for Dante, this is a problem. Next up, we have the Sowers of Discord, uh, chief among them, Mohammed. Uh, this is not a very politically correct section of the Inferno, I'm afraid. And uh, his son, Ali, which for modern readers, I suppose, invokes the infamous uh, or famous boxer, uh, though, of course, uh, purely accidental from Dante's perspective. And finally, we have the falsifiers of metals, of people, of coins, of words, you know, all this great stuff. And they are inflicted by a number of horrible diseases. So there's that. And then we go down, well, first, and then they come across all the giants, uh, including Nimrod, who built the Tower of Babel. I don't know what the basis is for seeing Nimrod who is a biblical figure in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 11? I want to say 10 or 11. I don't know what the basis would be for seeing him as a kind of giant figure, but I, I imagine that there's some. My guess would be that this is not an original interpretation to Dante, but I, I don't know enough to tell you for sure on that. Uh, and not all the giants are bad, and they meet the one kind of, you know, big friendly giant there who lowers them down to the final circle number nine and i gotta tell you i i don't know how everybody's reading these but if you haven't quite got to circle nine yet if you're a little bit behind i would encourage you when you reach those final three cantos so cantos 32 to 34 read them in one sitting because it is no pun intended here absolutely chilling to just feel the depth of despair as you get down into Canto 9. I, if you didn't understand, because you haven't gotten there yet, why I said no pun intended, it's because hell in Circle 9 is not hot, it is cold. The sinners, including Lucifer himself, are frozen into the ice of Circle 9 to various degrees, depending on uh, whom they were traitors to. So you have traitors to kin, homeland, guests and then their masters at the center of whom is Lucifer. And what struck me really reading this section is, you know, Dante's hell is a busy place. Like there's stuff going on everywhere you look. Um, but until you get to Canto 9, where there's no movement whatsoever, you know, as we get further down, they're not even allowed to, the sinners aren't even allowed to cry. Their tears are literally frozen in their eyes. And there's just this horrifying stillness that takes place at the bottom of hell. The one person who is moving, or person I use that term loosely, would be Satan himself right at the middle, who is enormous. He has three heads. I'm going to talk about the symbolism of Satan here in just a moment. Um, he has three heads, each of them chewing a traitor, the central one chewing Judas Iscariot, who is naked and is half in and half out of Satan's mouth. His front half is being chewed alive, while his bottom half is being clawed forever eternally. 
by Satan's claws. Meanwhile, Brutus and Cassius, uh, Caesar's killers, and this, by the way, again, is part of Dante's uh, biases or perhaps romantic interpretation of uh, Roman Empire, um, why these two get sent there. But, you know, again, depending on how you view that history, you might see them as pretty decent guy who saved Rome from a tyrant. Dante doesn't see it that way. Uh, he thinks that, you know, if Caesar had been allowed to live and continue to lead Rome, things could have gone very different for the empire. Uh, so Brutus and Cassius are chewed alive in the other two heads. Meanwhile, we find out that the reason that Circle Nine is frozen is because Satan's wings, which Dante is very clear to tell us, are not like bird wings, but are bat-like are beating forever and freezing what we'll find out is the river, river Lath, uh, and freezing the waters that flow into hell out of purgatory. More on that in just a moment. Uh, so that Satan in some sense is punished, but also his own punisher. He freezes himself where he stands. There's a, a lot you could talk about there in terms of the paradoxes of Dante's hell and the symbolism involved. I don't know how much of that we'll have time to get into. Our two poets, Virgil and Dante, then begin to climb down Satan's hairy body. Yes, Satan is as monstrous and inhuman as you can imagine. Once again, more on the symbolism of Satan in just a second. When they get halfway through, they have to turn around because they've literally gone through the center of the earth, and now they are climbing up. Dante thinks that Virgil just decided to heck with this, we're going back to hell, I guess. So maybe to hell with this would be, uh, if you can pardon the very minor vulgarity, would be the obvious joke to make there. But actually they are simply climbing up into purgatory and they're out of hell. And there are Satan's giant legs sticking up into the air. Why? Because he plunged from heaven. And that is how he found himself in the middle of the inferno. The symbolism there, especially like I've been saying, I want to talk about the symbolism of Satan because it is incredible. Uh, Matt and I were talking, Matt, if you're only a YouTube fan, you might not be familiar with him as much, though you should be, uh, is my intrepid co-host of the Sci-Fi Christian Podcast. Um, and we were talking about episodes we wanted to do. We wanted to do an episode on Satan for a long time, and specifically the theology of Satan. So hopefully we're going to get to that sometime this year. Uh, but I mentioned we, you know, we should do one on the theology of Satan, like we've talked about for a long time. But we should also do one on different interpretations of Satan in fiction because I, I think it's very fascinating. In particular, I can't help contrasting the Satan of. Uh, the Divine Comedy with the Satan of Paradise Lost, where if you've read Paradise Lost, and if you have, I have, uh, uh, I believe I've mentioned before, about eight hours worth of video, uh, videos analyzing Paradise Lost out here on the Sci-Fi Christian, so you can listen to me jabber on for quite a long time, if that's your thing. Uh, Milton's Satan is almost heroic in a sense. Now, Milton finds him repulsive, and, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, the whole idea that Satan is the secret hero of Paradise Lost has been quite overblown. Uh, but it, it is true to this extent that Satan is a charming character in Paradise Lost. He is this sort of angelic being. He is very, not far removed from his angelic nature and angelic existence in Milton's Paradise Lost. And that, of course, is part of the tragedy, if we choose to view Satan uh, less as the antagonist, so he certainly is that in Paradise Lost, but as the tragic figure at the center of this drama, that he is this beautiful being of light who foregoes that to become a creature of repulsive evil. Dante's Satan, on the other hand, is the polar opposite of that. Dante wants us to see him as anything but angelic. We do not want to see Satan as anthropomorphic at all. Uh, and I would say that Milton's uh, Satan, at least in the early books of Paradise Lost, is very anthropomorphic, you know, in line with how we would kind of visualize angels as men and women or you know, whatnot. 
um, arms, legs, all that good stuff. Satan is, for Dante, is not like that at all. He's a monster in the purest sense of the word. He is a horrible parody of the Trinity. That's why he has the three heads. Uh, he is the, if not the author of his own punishment, he is the reason that he continues to be punished. And I read a note on this, it might have been CRD, it might have been somewhere else, but just the almost paradoxical nature of the fact that it's Satan who ha keeps himself frozen there. You know, and it, it's almost as though to the paradox there, and again, I wish I had the source for this uh, that I, I remembered. It, it might have been Ciardi's introduction to Inferno. Uh, but it, that the paradox there is that if Satan would be still and accept his fate, his uh, punishment would be lessened in some way. But because he won't, because he's eternally defiant, he remains frozen in this block of ice uh, and really becomes a tool in the hand of God. I, I find it fascinating, too, that Satan is crying. You know, and you'll notice, and, and Ciardi brings this out with the, his word choice, uh, that his tears mimic the, the fate of those in the vestibule of hell, uh, where they're being stung by the wasps and hornets, and Ciardi describes bloody pus dripping out at them. Again, you know, Dante's very graphic. I apologize if that offends anyone, but we're not going to shrink from it in our discussion, where Satan is similarly uh, weeping bloody pus from his eyes. I don't know quite what to make of that connection, but I, I, I think it's interesting that it's there. Uh, and again, by the way, I apologize that my dog keeps hitting my tripod here and uh, making the camera shake a little bit. He is wound up. Uh, so we'll finish up the video and then go outside with him. You know, then there's a paradox along the lines of what we talked about last week, that hell is, in some ways, they're going deeper and deeper into the earth, but you're also drawing closer and closer to God. Satan is both simultaneously at the bottom of hell, but yet symbolically he is the closest to God in hell since he's the closest to purgatory, but yet his back is turned to God. It's, uh, I believe anyway, a symbol of this, you know, classical understanding of the fall of Satan, of a being of light, an angel of light that turns his back on God and the potential is there, but as a result, he finds himself at the bottom of all things. Um, and perhaps the most, oops, perhaps the most uh, interesting portion of his fate, and indeed the fate of all of those at Circle Nine, is that the river, River Lathe, that is flowing into hell out of purgatory, and I don't remember if Dante mentions this in the final canto, uh, but if not, it will become clear in the opening of Purgatorio, or close to the opening. But the River Lathe is where the, the, the blessed who are in, or soon to be blessed, who are part of Purgatorio more, and that whole dynamic next time, uh, they wash themselves, they're in the symbol of baptism, they're, they're cleansed in the River Lathe, and as a result, their sins flow away from Purgatory and, and away from heaven, as they are cleansed of them into hell, Satan is damned by the very sins that he helps to cause through being the father of lies and of evil and, and all these terrible things. It's really chilling, again, no pun intended, uh, and horrifying section of the Inferno. And, and I think you see Dante at the height of his genius here. Um, in terms of symbolism, in terms of his ability to disgust us, to horrify us, but then also to bring it home in a very personal way. And let me use that as a segue to then transition us into some of our Lenten reflections. I think that's a very powerful symbol, not only for our understanding of Dante's Satan, but for our understanding of ourselves in terms of what is going on with the River Lathe, carrying these frozen sins, or soon to be frozen sins, into the very bottom of hell. That's the central divide within Dante's understanding, that there are those who are able to 
be separated from their sins or willing to be separated from their sins. And those are the people we're going to meet in purgatory. And there are those who simply will not let go of their sins. And I think that if you do a careful reading of Dante's theology, and I don't want to stake too much on this because I'm not an expert, but I think Dante would have us understand that to a degree, just as Satan keeps himself frozen at the bottom of hell, the same is true of all of the sinners who are damned in the various circles. You know, he tells us right from the beginning when we see the sinners lined up waiting for the ferryman, Charon, uh, to take them into, into hell, that they're terrified, but yet it's what they want. You know, and... Uh, it brings me back to the C.S. Lewis quote that I, I've referenced earlier in these videos, that C.S. Lewis says that, well, what is hell? Hell is uh, a refusal for us to say to God, thy will be done, and thus God ultimately saying to us, thy will be done. A terrifying sentence if you really consider the implications of that. You know, and, and allow me to get a, a slightly controversial here for just a second. Uh, though I don't think it should be a controversial point. But it's become very trendy in modern Christianity, and I try to keep my... You know, oops, there goes the dog big time knocking that. I try, I try to keep my, my you know, ears open to what different strains of Christianity are, are thinking and saying. So, you know, I read Catholic sources, kind of a Catholic, but I also pay attention to what's going on in the evangelical world. I pay attention to what's going on in liberal strains of Christianity. You know, I, I just am interested in what... Christians as a whole are saying. And one of the most disturbing things that I've noticed in a lot of different segments of Christianity is a desire to not only get rid of the famous phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin, um, but to paint it as outright unbiblical. There's one Christian blogger, well, I use the term loosely since this person in question, um, doesn't believe Jesus is the Son of God, doesn't, you know, you could go down, he rejects all sorts of tenets in Orthodox Christianity. Uh, but he would go so far as to say, and I'll re re leave him nameless for now, he would go so far as to say that that phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin, is incompatible with Christianity. And to me, that's horrifying. That's just horrifying. Because, and let me be clear, that phrase and so many other wonderful things or that concept, I should say, not the phrase itself of that too, but that concept and so many other wonderful things about Christianity have been horribly abused by people. And absolutely, we need to stand against those abuses. Uh, uh, no ambiguity, ambiguity there. Uh, but that phrase, that concept that it represents, is the only hope in hell that we've got, you know? <laughs> or I should say, the only hope we've got of getting out of hell. Um, I think was more the line I was trying to go for in my confused way of expressing that. Why? Because what that phrase really means when you get right down to it, and it originates, a, a variation of it originates with St. Augustine, by the way, um, who's a pretty good guy to have in your camp, theologically speaking, is that we can be separated from our sins, uh, that we don't have to be our sins, that we don't have to be those who line up for the ferryman at the vestibule of hell and we get what we fear. You know, what we fear is what we want because we won't let go of our sins. The great hope of purgatory is that we're going to find is that the sinner go on, goes on and the sins wash into hell where they belong. And the only way I would argue, in Dante's world, and I think that there's a very strong case to be made for this in Christian theology at large. The only way we or anyone winds up in hell is if we insist on making the trip with our sins uh, down the river and into the great inferno. It's a very chilling thought, and that's why I find myself horrified, frankly, when I see Christians say, no, 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 we got to do away with that whole concept. You know, just love people. That sounds great, but I don't want to be just loved. I want to be separated from my sin because my sin is what winds me up in the vestibule of hell waiting for Charon to take me over so that Minos can assign me my proper circle. And I don't know about you during this journey 
through the inferno over the last few weeks. But if I'm honest with myself, I can see a lot of different stops along the way where because of my particular sins, I would be right at home in. Right uncomfortably, horrifically at home in. And I imagine that that's true of all of us, if we're honest. And I don't want that to be the case. So, the Lenten reflection for this week, then, is that however you, whatever your thoughts on that phrase are, uh, and I know that peop some people out there have been very personally damaged by others abusing that phrase, and again, I don't want to minimize that, but whatever your own thoughts and experiences are on that, I hope that you allow Lent, and especially as we now move into Purgatorio and our journey here, to be an opportunity to let God separate you from your sins, because that's the only hope we've got. Um, quite frankly, if Christianity can't do that, what good is it? And that's a strong claim. But if Christianity can't get us to the point where the sinner can go on and the sins wash away into hell where they belong. What good is it at the end of the day? Not much. It's certainly no better than any other social reform program that humans have come up with uh, over the centuries. Um, so again, it might be slightly controversial to take what really is an unpopular stance in uh, modern Christianity. Um, but I think it's a stance worth taking, and I think it's a stance that if we're going to understand the theology of the Inferno, we have to be willing to at least internalize it enough to grasp what that means, uh, even if ultimately you disagree, which of course is everyone's prerogative to do, certainly uh, with me, much less uh, with Dante or, you know, whoever. Uh, you know, we're all entitled to our own theological opinions and views and all that good stuff. All right, so that's kind of what I got for you this week. Um, I just find this section of the Inferno so absolutely chilling and powerful uh, that I almost just want to encourage you to, for as horrifying as it is, meditate on it, let it in, let it sink in, let, uh, you know, let the implications of what Dante has to say to us here uh, really impact you. And uh, hopefully by doing so, you'll continue to be able to have an effective and powerful Lent as we move through this journey together. Uh, two notes here as we wrap up. Again, just to reiterate, through Purgatorio Canto 9 by next Friday. So a little bit less to read. If you're a little bit behind, good chance to kind of catch up on a canto or two. Or at least not fall any farther behind. Which, by the way, if you are behind, don't get discouraged, okay? It's okay to do this journey at your own pace, you know, Obviously, these videos are going to be out there on YouTube long after the Lent and Easter seasons of 2015 are over. Uh, I'm sure people will watch them then, and they're reading the Inferno at their own pace. Um, totally fine. Don't get discouraged. And if you are behind uh, during this time right now, Lent and Easter 2015, uh, keep in mind that we do kind of slow down a little bit from here. So if the reading pace is a bit aggressive for you, uh, initially, things are going to slow down from here on out, so good chance to get caught up. All right, so that's note number one. Note number two is that Matt and I on the Sci-Fi Christian Podcast are going to do an episode on the Inferno this next week. Uh, so if you're watching this shortly after I post it, you can look for that um, within the next week or so. If you're watching this long after I post it and you want to go back and find that episode, it's going to be either episode 341 or 342, just depending on how we order the episodes that we record this next week. So be on the lookout for that. Um, you'll hear a little bit more from me in terms of some stuff that maybe I didn't get a chance to work into in our discussion of, of the Inferno here. Uh, but I, I want to spend more of the time hearing from Matt, because this is the first time he's read Dante, uh, hearing what his experience is, his thoughts are. You know, we're going to do some fun stuff, as we always do on the Sci-Fi Christian Podcast, so it should be a good listen. I'm really looking forward to the episode, and I hope you'll tune into that as well. So look for that next week, uh, or, or if you're watching this in the future, when it's no longer next week, episode either 341 or 342. All right, everyone, that does it for me. I'm Bendy Bono, and I will talk to you all later. Happy reading, and enjoy Purgatorio.